So I'm going to introduce Dr. Liebman, who I'm very happy to have here tonight. Dr. Nicole Liebman re received her DVM from the University of Minnesota and did her internship here at Animal Medical Center. She completed her medical oncology residency at Colorado State University. She joined AMC as a staff oncologist in 2001, and she has conducted clinical trials and published results on the canine melanoma vaccine for both oral and digit tumors, canine mast cell tumors, canine mesothelioma, canine osteosarcoma, and soft tissue sarcoma. Dr. Liebman has also studied the treatment of mast cell tumors in dogs and published several studies on the staging and treatment of this disease. She has recently completed a study looking at glutathione supplementation and absorption in dogs. She was awarded the Robert S. Brody Memorial Award for Outstanding Clinical Science Research Project in Oncology, and she has ongoing clinical trials investigating immunotherapy for injection site sarcomas in cats and evaluating markers for feline lymphoma, as well as evaluating vitamin D levels in dogs with lymphoma. Currently, she's closely collaborating with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and NYU Langone Medical Center on a project looking at the genomic analysis of canine tumors. So she's very busy, and she's very well qualified to be speaking to you all tonight. So please welcome Dr. Liebman. I'm glad everyone is here. Uh, so we'll make this as informal as I can. They tell me that I can't take any questions while I speak. I usually like to, but we'll follow the rules and then we can certainly answer questions after. Okay? Let me know if you can't hear me. No? Yes? A little louder. Okay. I can speak very loudly. Uh, okay, here we go. So just a little background. So this may look a little confusing, but really it is just a cartoon of really the life cycle of a cell. Uh, so the cell goes around this way clockwise during its life cycle. So if you are a child and you are growing, your cells are always cycling because you're growing. So you need to make more cells. Your cells divide, they become two cells, those two cells become four cells, and so on. As an adult, your cells are resting or what we call quiescent. They're in this area called, we call it g naught. That's the area of which adult cells rest until they're called upon. Other than cells like intestinal cells and hair cells, right, our hair is always growing, which is why when you get chemotherapy, you lose your hair because chemotherapy impacts rapidly dividing cells. So that gets me to cancer. So cancer is a little bit like juvenile cells. Cancer is always the cells are always dividing. They're always, that's how the tumor grows. So it's a little bit like a child, unfortunately. So that's really the take home message from this slide. So in like 2000, the Morris Animal Foundation did a survey of pet owners. And lo and behold, not, not surprising, the largest health concern among people for their pets was cancer. I'll tell you that cancer is not the largest problem but it, people perceive it as the largest problem. And second um, was heart disease at 7%. So why do we worry about cancer in animals? Um, we worry about it for some obvious reasons, right? Because we love our animals and cancer is a buzzword that scares all of us as human beings, as pet owners, as family members and whatnot. I worry about it because I do comparative research. I'm also a clinician, that's my first love, but I do comparative research. And what does that mean? I look at mostly the dog, but also the cat, but mostly the dog as an outbred species. And what does that mean? So it's not, a dog is not a mouse. A mouse is something that, other than the mice that you find outside running around or the rats, those are different than laboratory mice, which are inbred. They're bred in a laboratory, they're specific bred for a particular need. So they either have an extra gene or they have a gene missing. They're really genetically engineered for a particular purpose. Dogs are not like that. They're outbred species just like us. And because of that, they get similar diseases that people get. But because their lifespan is much shorter than ours, their diseases are abbreviated. So typical survival for a dog with lymphoma is about a year, whereas a human being could live 15 years with a very similar type of lymphoma. So what we do is we collaborate with institutions like Sloan Kettering and NYU, and we take 
medications that are being developed in laboratories, and we use them after we know they're safe. We use them in our patients to look at what kind of results we can glean from and then apply that to people. And everybody wins, right? So then I get to treat my patients often on clinical trials, and then we don't have to bring in the financial component, which is really draining for all of us, as we know. Um, so that doesn't work all the time. We don't have clinical trials for all diseases, but we have clinical trials for some diseases. And then we can take that information that we collect from these trials and apply it not only to to dogs, but we can apply it to humans. And that data is much more credible than data that we collect from mice. And also, our pets share the same environment that, that we do, right? We know that cats that live in, an, in a household where people smoke are at risk for oral cancer. And the reason for that is that cats groom themselves, right? So when they groom themselves, the residue from cigarette smoke is on their coats and that puts them at risk for oral cancer. And any other toxins that we may be exposed to, our pets are exposed to them also. This is a, um, right here, this is a mitotic figure. That means that this cell is dividing and should not be in an adult tissue. So that's what I was talking about in that previous slide of where cells that should not be dividing are. So why else do we worry about cancer in pets? Um, cancer is on the rise. It's on the rise in people. It's on the rise in animals. And mostly it's on the rise because we all live longer, right? Our pets are living longer. In the 70s and in the 60s, animals died of infectious disease. And that's because we didn't have all the vaccines that we have today that protect them against horrifying diseases. Now they live through those diseases or they don't get them, hopefully, um, but then they live longer. And as we live longer as humans, as animals, our mutations that we have every day in our bodies don't get repaired as well as when we're young. So the older we get, the more likely we are to develop cancer. There's about a hundred and, sorry about that, 165 million cats and dogs that are at risk for cancer in the US, and each year about 4 million dogs and cats will develop cancer. 45% of all dogs that live past age 10 will die of cancer, 32% of cats. So what are the most common cancers in dogs, right? Everyone always wants to know about this. Mast cell tumors are far and beyond the most common tumor that we see in dogs. Uh, if they were as bad as the textbooks tell us they were, there wouldn't be any dogs because they're extraordinarily common. We see them all the time and they're very treatable. Many, many are curable. Melanoma, this is a much more serious disease. It, occur it occurs mostly in the mouth, unlike in people where we see it on the skin mostly and on the toe. Lymphoma, most common disease we see in the dog, unlike un, other than the skin disease, which is mast cell disease. This occurs in the lymph nodes and in the intestinal tract and in the skin. Osteosarcoma, which is a disease of bones. Uh, this is a disease that occurs in children. About 5,000 children will develop osteosarcoma per year. 15,000 dogs will develop osteosarcoma in a year. That's why osteosarcoma is a great disease to be studied in dogs because we have more of it. And sadly, typical survival is about a year. So we can study treatments much more readily than we can in children. And then we can apply that to children. And then hemangiosarcoma is also a very common disease that we see generally dogs present, um, German shepherds, golden retrievers present with ruptured spleens. Um, with um, blood in their abdomen. It's an emergency generally, and that's a very common disease also. I wanted to mention breast cancer. So that's an interesting disease. Not that common in this country because we believe in spaying and neutering our animals. All of our pets should be spayed and neutered other than breeding animals. So, and we, we subscribe to that in, that in this country. And the good news about that is when we spay our animals before their first heat, the incidence of breast cancer is almost zero. That is not the case in other countries. And I'm gonna show you a chart in a minute, but especially the Scandinavian countries where they just don't su subscribe to this practice. They don't believe in it. And their breast cancer is the most common disease that they see in the dog. 
So this is a chart. This comes out of the UK, actually. And this describes the most common diseases that they see there. Mammary is this a word that we use in veterinary medicine, which is synonymous with, with breast. And they see mast cell tumors also, lymphomas, osteosarcomas, and they do have breast on their list. These are benign tumors, adenomas, lipomas are those fatty sort of swellings that everyone feels on their older dogs. Never diagnose it yourself. Never let your vet tell you it's a lipoma without testing it. So it's very important because a mast cell tumor, like I just talked about, can feel exactly the same as a lipoma. So it must be tested for you to determine the diagnosis. Most common breeds that get cancer. That's the other side of the coin, right? Golden Retriever, far and beyond, is the most common dog that I see that develops cancer. Boxers probably are more likely to develop cancer than Goldens. I just don't see as many boxers. They're just not as popular as Golden Retrievers are, but they certainly develop, uh, not only do they develop cancer, but most of my boxer patients have multiple forms of cancer. The Rottweiler, Bernie's Mountain Dog, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but the Bernese Mountain Dog is a, is a specific certain type of example where they have a genetic abnormality that has been well worked out where they develop a disease called histiocytic sarcoma. Sadly, the vast majority of Bernese Mountain Dogs will die of this disease. Bouviers, Labradors, Bichons, Great Danes, and German Shepherds. So cancers and breeds, if we link them together, Osteosarcoma, I just talked about that. That's the bone tumor that generally occurs in the legs. Uh, this is our large breed dogs. So this, interestingly, this disease also occurs in large children. It's typically a disease of large male adolescent children, and it's a disease of large or giant breed dogs. The thought behind that is when you have a large skeleton, there are micro fractures. Every time you walk, you are causing stress on that skeleton from the heavy weight of, of your body. That causes these micro fractures, and the micro fractures set up an environment for cancer. Again, it's a very rare disease, thankfully. We really generally don't have to worry about it, but the sort of the correlation is quite interesting. Mast cell tumors, which we talked about before, um, most dogs are on this list, I will tell you, that it's such a common tumor that we see it in almost all dogs. And don't forget, I didn't really put mixed breed dogs on any of these lists, but they're, they're on all the lists also. And the thought, you know, historically people would say, you know, mixed breed dogs are healthier than, than purebreds. I have to tell you, we don't really see that worked out in the clinic. So, um, I, of course, I always believe in, you know, adopt, don't shop, but the reality is I'm not sure that our mixed breeds are that much healthier than our purebreds. Hemangiosarcoma, I talked about that before. Most common in German Shepherds. Goldens are certainly at risk also. Uh, anal gland carcinoma, it's a, dogs have this certain gland. I'm sure everyone has smelled this really horrific smell who has a dog. Raise your hand if you've smelled that. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. Uh, so people don't have those, thank goodness. Um, and there is a tumor that, that arises from these really unnecessary glands. And squamous cell carcinoma in the standard poodle typically arises from the toe, just like melanoma. And the golden retriever I put up there again because they're really the star of my show, and they, uh, they get everything. Mast cell tumors, what do they look like? So they can, they're generally dermal, meaning of the skin, reddened, raised, they can be itchy, they can be ulcerated, they can look like this here. So of course, you know, if you see something like this that you think just looks like a sore or a bug bite, certainly you wanna see your veterinarian and determine what the underlying cause is. Melanoma, so this is what melanoma looks like generally in the foot area, and this is what it looks like in the mouth area. So I would say it's easy generally to evaluate the feet of your dogs, but much more difficult to evaluate the mouth of your dog. Some dogs are easy and you can open their mouths and have a good look in there. You always wanna look under the tongue, and some dogs are much more difficult. They're difficult for us as, as doctors to even look at them, but you have to make sure when you see your veterinarian that you ask them, right? You're the advocate for your 
pet, you need to say, did you do a good oral exam? Did you look under the tongue? You make sure that your pet has had a good exam. Because if we find these diseases, you know, in their infancy, these can be curable diseases. Lymphoma, what does that look like? So typically, they'll have these large swellings under their chin. That's typically what it looks like. And those are hard to recognize also. But you know, you wanna put your hands on your dogs, you wanna know your dogs, you wanna know what they feel like, you wanna be familiar with them because they cannot tell you if something feels abnormal. Osteosarcoma, we talked about that, the bone cancer. So this is what it looks like on an X-ray. Right here, this is a, this is a uh, femur your thigh bone, and this right here is a moth, what's called moth-eaten uh, part of the bone that has been destroyed by the tumor. And this is a lovely golden who had this disease on the beach that had an amputation and is doing fabulously well. He also swims in the ocean with three legs. How about cats? We should talk about cats, right? I see more cats than I see dogs, so more people in New York City have cats than dogs. More people in New York City have cats than children. <laughs> so, um, all right, so what's the most common cancer in cats? So the most common cancer I see far and beyond is lymphoma. Uh, typically it's of the intestines, but really anywhere in the abdomen. It also can occur in the nose. Breast cancer in cats is less predictable than ca breast cancer in in dogs. So breast cancer in dogs is very much like breast cancer in people. It has a spectrum, right? People can get sort of benign breast cancer all the way to extraordinarily malignant breast cancer. Cats always get malignant breast cancer. So they're not such a great model for people because they don't get the spectrum like people do. It's also not preventable if you spay before the first heat. It kind of has a mind of its own breast cancer in the cat. Squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity, I mentioned that before. You know, if you smoke, you should stop smoking because you're putting your pets at risk and it's not good for you either. Uh, and fibrosarcoma of the skin and muscle, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Lymphoma, what does that look like? So it can look kind of like the mast cell tumors that I showed you in the cat, uh, in the dog. Um, I can't really show you what it looks like in the intestine because I think, I actually had a slide but I was worried someone would vomit or something, so I, I took it down. But I, I do love um, cells, so I, I included this. I just think cells are so beautiful, and these purple, really deep staining cells are all lymphoma cells, and so this is what nerdy oncologists get excited about. Um, so we look under the microscope, and then we know what it is. And so we can, you know, it's an easy diagnosis for us, so we're happy to do that quickly so we can get on to the treatment phase. Breast cancer in cats. So this is what it looks like. We hope that we find it much sooner than that. So those of you with cats, you need to do breast exams on your cats. You do your own breast exam once a month and you do your breast exam on your cat. If you're a male, you still should do your breast exam because men get breast cancer too and you do your breast exam on your cat. And so this is a kitty that had a radical mastectomy um, and doing great. Cats do great. They do better than women do. They walk on four legs, right? They don't have to stand upright, so they don't have to stretch their musculature like, like people do. So they walk on four legs. They can sort of hunch over as they heal. Most cats go home in a couple of days and two weeks later are running around and jumping as they had before their surgery. Squamous cell carcinoma. So this is a disease that I talked about. It can happen in the mouth, but it can also happen on the nose and the ears. Not so much in New York City. This is typically a disease of cats that live outside. When I was in Colorado and it's at 5,000 feet, the, the solar radiation is really intense there, right? So I saw lots and lots of cases that had these sort of lesions on their ears and their nose. So take home message there is that really we should not have outdoor pets. But if we have outdoor pets, they should wear sunscreen. Fibrosarcoma in cats. So this is a whole lecture in and of itself, but this disease very commonly occurs in between the shoulder blades and on the limbs. And the reason why this disease occurs, sadly, is secondary to vaccines. Not the vaccines that we use in this hospital and not the way we vaccinate here and not the way most 
veterinarians vaccinate anymore. So this should not um, inhibit you from vaccinating your cat because most all veterinarians have changed their practice. Unfortunately, this disease can take 10 to 15 years to develop. So a cat that was vaccinated 15 years ago by a vaccine that we knew put an animal at risk can cause a tumor now. So these are very, very difficult diseases to treat. So again, any swelling, any lump, anything you find on your animal should be checked out. So how do we diagnose disease in animals? Just like we do in people, right? So this is a, this is a pet getting um, an ultrasound right here. So we do blood work, we do cytology, which means we extract some cells with a needle, we look at it on, under the microscope, we do biopsies, we do radiographs or x-rays, we do CAT scans, MRIs, and even PET scans or PET-CT. So this is a dog in our CT machine. They're, they are anesthetized, as you can see here. He's breathing his, his anesthesia and his oxygen right here. He has to be asleep. There's no other way that we can do a CAT scan unless they're asleep because a CAT scan has radiation. So it is not appropriate for anyone, a nurse, a veterinarian, to be in the room while that radiation is being delivered. It's a small amount. It's an important test. Uh, but nonetheless, we cannot expose ourselves over and over again as opposed to a person that can sit still because you tell them to do so. This is a CAT scan of a dog with a nasal tumor. So basically it's a slice through the head this way. And this is the sinus area. So the sinus should be black. So air should look black on a CAT scan. And all of the, this is the, the, the septum between the sinuses. You have two sinuses up here. And as you can see, this bone, this dark white here is doesn't exist here. And that's because this tumor has eaten through the bone into this sinus. So this is what's called a nasal sinus adenocarcinoma. This is the skull of the dog. This is the, the bottom jaw. And this is actually the tube that the dog is breathing through. This is an x-ray. This is the dog laying on its side. This is his neck. These are his shoulders. Um, this is his heart. These are his lungs. Again, lungs are black because they have air in them. And this is a very large lung tumor right here. So this is a slide. Again, I, anyone that comes here is clearly um, clever enough to want to know more. So I figure more knowledge is better than none. So the reason I'm putting this on here is because I think this is super interesting. This is called immunohistochemistry. So this is a biopsy. And what we do here now is we don't just do a biopsy. We don't take a biopsy, process it, and look it under the microscope. We actually do what's called further testing, and we do special stains to be absolutely 100% sure that the diagnosis is what it is. So things have really evolved in the last 10 years where we used to just look under the microscope, look at the tissue and say, okay, your dog has a melanoma, we think. But now there's no thinking, now we're sure. So this is, a, all the brown is melanin, which is the pigment that makes up the cells that make up a melanoma. So right here, we're 100% sure that this is a melanoma. Treatments, there's my spokes, dog as always, right? I have to at least um, feature the golden retriever. Uh, surgery. So just a little background on our team. So we're up on the eighth floor. Many of you have been up there many times. Some of you have not. You're welcome to visit any time. So we are a whole cancer institute. And what that is comprised of is medical oncologists. There's three, a radiation oncologist and a surgical oncologist. So we all meet together all the time, multiple times throughout the day to speak about cases and to make sure that there is a multi-modality approach. So many times, many cases need surgery. Um, often it's just for diagnostic purposes, for a biopsy, and other times it's for therapeutic processes. Usually that's solid tumors, the carcinomas, the sarcomas, mast cell tumors, uncommonly for the lymphomas and the leukemias. Those are treated solely, generally, by the medical oncologists. Chemotherapy, which I think we all know what that is. Radiation therapy, we have a very sophisticated machine in the basement, exactly what, 
what's used at Sloan Kettering. We're able to do what's called radio surgery. Uh, radio surgery is an alternative to conventional surgery. It's not always indicated, but it can be for certain tumors like brain tumors, where we can avoid going in there and being really aggressive, which where we know there'd be, you know, always risk for major side effects, especially when you're mucking with a tissue like brain tissue. So we can do radio surgery, which in some cases is equivalent to conventional surgery. Uh, molecular and targeted therapy. Um, we certainly do immunotherapy. We use a melanoma vaccine that's been shown to be really effective. All of those original studies came out of this institution, and we use that to treat melanoma. Um, we have a whole integrative medicine, ser uh, medicine service that is also on the eighth floor, and um, we have a brilliant doctor, Dr. Le Leilani Alvarez, who um, in um, can provide acupuncture and herbs and supplements and everyone always wants to know about those things. Um, I'm Western medicine trained. I am not the person that you want help with from that, but Dr. Alvarez is amazing and so we all work together so we can really provide a holistic approach. Um, and then of course we have clinical trials and those work really well for some people and some pets with some diseases. So supportive treatment. Um, Nutritional support. Nutritional support is very important. We take it very seriously, and there are many options. Um, many of our cats have feeding tubes. That sounds very offensive to a lot of people, but if you come and you see these cats and you see how they do, some of them live years that way, and they have an excellent quality of life, and they just need to be supported through their disease process. They can certainly eat on their own supplements like I talked about. Pain medication is also a very, very important part of cancer treatment. We need to make sure first and foremost that our patients are incredibly comfortable. That is beyond, you know, quality certainly is much more important than quantity. Uh, rehab therapy, this is a dog that uh, had a spinal tumor that is in the underwater treadmill. Uh, rehabbing, which is amazing. And what they do, which I love to go watch, is so this is glass right here. They put peanut butter on the glass, and the dog learns to walk in the underwater treadmill. I mean, some dogs are better than others, right? The retrievers, the big dogs, they love to swim anyway, so they're excited to get in there. The little ones, not so much. And so we train them by putting peanut butter on there, and they lick, they have to keep walking to get to the peanut butter. So it works really well, actually. Um, and then massage therapy, we do that too. And um, some love it. The cats, we try, not always that great, but sometimes, some cats will, will, will tolerate it. I never would say love it, but tolerate. Um, so warning signs and prevention. This is really the take home message, right? The rest of it, you can leave to your doctors. So top 10 warning signs. Um, Abnormal swellings, anything, anything that's there for really more than a week should be checked out. Uh, sores that don't heal, sores by the toes, sores around the eyes, sores around the nose, sores around the anus, sores on the abdomen, anywhere. If they're not healing after a good week or so, you need to come in. Don't assume that it happened when your dog was running in the park. Don't make any assumptions. If it's not healing, you come in. Weight loss is a biggie, of course. Uh, decreased appetite, difficulty eating or swallowing. Bleeding or discharge from any opening in the body, obviously. Any offensive odor. Typically, offensive odors are, are really prominent with oral tumors. Uh, reluctance to exercise or loss of stamina. Stiffness or lameness. We know that many of our older patients have arthritis, but don't just assume that it is arthritis. Get it checked out. Um, difficulty breathing, urinating, or defecating. Prevention. So this is our extraordinarily brilliant Heather Browza. Maybe some of you know her. She runs our community practice. She's wonderful. She, if you don't have a vet, that's who you should see someone from that team. If you have a vet, we're always willing to work directly with them. We love to do that. So yearly veterinary visits, Absolutely, even if it's an indoor cat, your animal needs to go to the vet every year. I'm not saying they have to be vaccinated every year. I, that is not my specialty, and I'm not going to comment on vaccines, but there are, there are options to opt out of vaccines, but your animal still has to go to the veterinarian to be checked every year. Blood work, I think after age six, all animals should have full blood panel every year. And then we talk about things like chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasound. 
So, you know, I have a little bit of a warped view on life because I see cancer every day. But we think of ourselves as, you know, as humans, we all need mammograms, you know, after age 45, we all need prostate exams, we all need colonoscopies, right? So why should we treat our pets any differently? This is not published, this is my opinion, but I will tell you that it, your money is well spent by doing these screening tests after age six, certainly after age eight. Uh, chest radiographs, simply to just sort of screen for any asthma, heart disease, lung cancer, et cetera, and an abdominal ultrasound is incredibly helpful. It evaluates all of the abdominal organs, and if we find these diseases when they're small, they're often curable. The problem is that we often don't see diseases until the animal is sick, and once they're sick, it can be difficult to reverse the process. So it's really important, if you can, to be vigilant. And this is a guy that is in a wheelchair on the beach um, who uh, had a spinal tumor and is doing fantastically well. And that's it. So I'm happy to answer questions. And thank you, Dr. Liebman. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions, so please just hold your questions until I come to you with the mic. So if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question. Hi. Um, I have giant schnauzers. I've had them for 30 years. Uh, they're rescues. And um, It's okay if they're not. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's all right. No, the first two weren't, but the rest were. Um, th I've, they've, I've lost them to a variety of cancers. You know, Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the latest one, though, he had a toe removed for squamous cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. And the doctor is prescribing paroxicam mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. Have you had any experience with that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, paroxicam is a drug that's part of a large group of drugs called NSAIDs, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. So, you know, Advil's in that class, Tylenol's in that class. Um, and the question is, does it have utility in this setting? And all I can tell you is that there are some studies to show that paroxicam specifically does have some anti-cancer properties. Is it effective in preventing the squamous cell carcinoma? The truth of the matter is nobody knows that. Most importantly, is it, is it gonna hurt your dog? So the good news about being on a drug like paroxicam is that you have a giant schnauzer by definition, they're going to have arthritis if they have they don't have it already. So that's a great drug to sort of inhibit um, or help treat the signs associated with arthritis. So can kind of kill two birds with one stone. That's sort of a weird thing for a veterinarian to say. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but anyway, um, I, I would say as long as it's not hurting your dog, I think it's a reasonable approach. I do think you have to watch kidney and liver values with that. So as long as things are stable, I would certainly recheck the liver and kidneys every six months. Okay. Thank you. I have a question from social media. Anne-Marie wants to know, and this has come up a lot, is do you recommend CBD oil to help with pain management? And similar question with things like CBD oil and supplements, how do pet owners know if they're good or not? So again, this is not my area of expertise. Dr. Alvarez is really the expert there. Um, to be completely, you know, full disclosure, I'm not really supposed to talk about CBD oil. Um, I work under a college called the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. That's where my board certification is through. And because we live in New York State and the laws are still a little tricky, I'm not really allowed to advise whether or not you should give your pet CBD oil. Um, what else can I say? There certainly seems to be a lot of promise in the literature. It's certainly the buzzword of, of the year, um, but there's been many other buzzwords. I remember when everyone thought shark cartilage was like the thing, and we all know now that it's completely useless. So I, I think it's evolving, and we have to watch, and we have to look for studies. There's only one study that's been done thus far, uh, and so we don't nearly have any sort of information to sort of make any great declarations yet, is really the best that I can say. 
That's helpful. Thank you. And we also have really? one from, <laughs> from Deborah um, who uh, says, my 15-year-old cat was diagnosed in December with small cell lymphoma, and I just found out she'll need to continue to receive steroids and chemo for the rest of her life. Why is that? She is responding very well to treatment. Well, and I have some small cell lymphoma stars in the audience here that I take care of, but um, so you know, that's, that may be one veterinarian's approach. I won't say that that's necessarily our approach. We are constantly reevaluating, and, and any disease should be reevaluated, right? Although uncommon, any disease is potentially curable. So we don't say anything for life here. We take it visit by visit, and we constantly reevaluate, and there's always an opportunity to stop chemotherapy if an animal has proven to us that they can handle their situation without it. Hi. Hi. Um, do you find any uh, correlation between steroids that a dog takes all the time for the rest of her life um, and cancers? Um, unfortunately, she's already had mast cell tumor, and she just had liver cancer six months ago, but she is on steroids for uh, IBD. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, no, no. There's no data to suggest that long-term chronic steroid use um, puts them at risk for cancer. You know, other things, infection, you know, um, certainly cartilage degeneration, which, you know, but you always weigh everything, right? right? Benefits versus risks. But, you know, there are plenty of dogs walking around this hospital in this city on chronic long-term steroids. Steroids are a great drug if used appropriately. Of course. Hi. I just Hi. wanted to ask what the veterinary medical community is doing to address um, the corporations that create the food, that actually some of them do carry carcinogens, things like carrageenan is an ingredient that's often in the pâtés for dogs and for cats. And that, uh, even though it comes from organic red seaweed, it causes inflammation of the intestine. And any inflammation contributes and can contribute to cancers in humans and in animals. And I think the greatest preventive measure could store in the actually the food that it, we feed our pets. And unless everybody has the time to cook the food for their pets at home, so what do we do about the companies that create the food that have products in it or ingredients in it that are very harmful? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. And people are really more than ever so interested in what their pets are eating, which is great. Uh, I have to say first that there are no good studies to show that any of the large commercial dog food companies, you know, that those foods cause cancer. I won't dispute that there may be some ingredients that have been shown in certain studies. I'm not aware of those, to be totally honest with you. I will say, though, that there is sort of this new move towards using foods that are human grade. And so, you know, most dog foods do not use human grade food. Um, and that is a problem for some people. Um, you know, I, I want to just say that, you know, cooking for your dog or these sort of human grade dog foods or cat foods are very expensive. And so I would say if you can't do that, the best thing you can do is just feed your dog a good quality dog food or cat food. However, if you're interested in sort of taking it to another level, there are some companies now. I just went to a lecture the other day uh, with a company called Just Food for Dogs. They do have cat food too, though, by the way. It's a real, I was really impressed. I don't I have no stock in this company or anything, so I'm, and I'm not going to use it for my dog because it's too expensive. But I will tell you that. Um, um, but it is very interesting. They have a kitchen in LA, a kitchen in Seattle, and a kitchen now in Union Square, and it's really a cool-looking place. And and they use it's rice and chicken and sweet potato. Um, it's not carb-free if anyone wants sort of that, but they do have a typical diet for your sort of regular pet. They have a cancer diet. They have a kidney diet. Um, and it's basically uh, cooked food, and it's um, sort of shrink-wrapped and frozen. And they'll deliver it to you, or you can pick it up. But I, I was impressed with that. And there's a couple other companies that do that too. There are nutritionists that you can consult with that will develop diets for your pet that you can cook at home. There are many options. As far as what's been being done as a veterinary community, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm not a nutritionist, and it's just not a field that I'm committed to at this moment. There's no disputing. I, I agree. Um, and, you know, 
don't forget, what we do in veterinary medicine is much younger than where we are in human medicine. We just don't have the dollars to support a lot of those studies, but we're trying. We're getting there, and I think these new companies that are really looking at using human-grade foods is really quite interesting. I'm hoping that's the wave of the future. Thank you, Dr. Lehman. We're just going to move on because this could be a whole other lecture, as, and we've touched on nutrition in the past. I'm going to go up here for another question. Um, I have a 12 and a half year old um, mudigree, and um, he had um, a uh, fibrosarcoma, um, and he had it grew to about four pounds, wow. and he had his leg like, amputated. Um, it's over two years. They did a full body CAT scan, and he had a couple of small things near his liver and stuff. They didn't aspirate because they felt that it wasn't necessary, mm -hmm. and they said if it was malignant, he'd be dead in three months. It's more than two years, great. <laughs> and he's still hopping along. Oh, congratulations. Um, That's great yeah, news. Yeah, except for he, he started growing another tumor mm -hmm. at the amputation site. Okay. And I was at several vets, and none of them seemed very concerned. I said, you know, let's biopsy. This is very concerning to me. And sure enough, there were spindle cells. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's how the other tumor started. Because they were like, oh, that's slow growing. Blah, blah, blah. So now um, I want to remove it. Okay. Um, cause, and he's cleared for surgery, his blood work is good, a little high cholesterol, a little elder dog thing. That's okay, dogs don't die of And of a, little, you know, a little high so. sugar, you know. <laughs> but everything is pretty good. He had chest x-rays twice. The problem is he has, he's <coughs> having this persistent sort of post-nasal drip cough that I can't, we can't do anything about. And uh, he's taken steroids, he's his been on antibiotics. Excuse me? His chest x-rays are normal? Everything's normal. So that's, it's all, and I know because I squeeze up here and it provokes, it, it, he starts the, the coughing. He has nasal discharge? He has nasal, well, yeah, it's more like post-nasal drip. But no nasal discharge? A little bit, a little wet, you know, but not really horrible. You know, sometimes dogs get GERD, like people do, gastroesophageal reflux. And he, and he reflux. has like, you know, sleep so apnea kind of thing. Sometimes you know, Prilosec helps, so you can try that, it's over the counter. Yeah, because some, like even when he's eating, he's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that helps, like that, and then like he'll just like, yeah. No, yeah, but it, but it, it's up all night, and then he drinks a whole lot of water, mm -hmm. and you know. So then, what what we think about is that you know, is he going to aspirate during the surgery, and what we other have good kind of ways of preventing that from happening. But it sounds like that needs they were to be scope him in the yeah, yeah that needs to be worked up. Thing. Yeah, but to I, me, it's all in the sinus. Yeah, but they can scoop they can scope that also. They can. Yeah, and you think it's so safe for him to have. Uh, I you think you need to know what's going on. Yeah, right? because to me that's more troubling. It's yeah. And it makes him exhausted. Yeah, I think if it's impacting his quality of life and, you know, inhibiting him from being able to have the surgery for his tumor, we need to know what's well, going no, on. Well, they say it's a, they, they would go ahead and do it in scope at the same time. I'm just a little concerned about it. So separate it. the procedures. It's, I think you can do that. To me, I want to take the tumor off. I mean, four vets would go, eh, yeah, whatever. But to me, take it off, like, because it's about golf ball size now, and I'm just yeah, like, it should I come mean, off. They already took off the whole leg. How much more can you take off? Right. But is that very common, like for that kind of thing to? Ha I mean, it for because I didn't do any radiation. I didn't do right. Any so I don't know what the original margins were. Whether they got all the cancer they out. Said they did because he did a CAT scan. I mean, yeah. they were pretty so thorough. So you determine that based on the biopsy. Uh, yeah, and the then they did a biopsy of the entire leg. And they said all the cancer was gone. Yeah, I mean, any you know the problem is in veterinary medicine, if we take out a tumor that's this large. We're only, you know, we're unfortunately, we only have the really the capacity to look at some of it. We can't look at it all. So even though it looked like they got it all out, sometimes there's still cells left behind. Oh, thank you. But good luck with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Doctor. Um, thank, I just have a quick question. I have a, a 14 and a half year old Italian Greyhound, and I'm starting to see spots and stuff on her, although the doctor says that there's nothing wrong, um, like a fatty tumor, and there's something on her eye, like a dark spot that's been getting bigger been there for probably seven years but it's starting to grow now and I'm a little concerned but my my question is basically also the uh, with her mouth I mean she's had I've seen Dr. Western Dr. Fox and she's not able to really go under for any kind of procedure and I'm concerned about her mouth um, very bad smelling mouth I brush her teeth but now I mean how would I know would you be able to see if there's any kind of cancer growing? You usually can see. So I'm sure Dr. Fox and Dr. West, who are excellent doctors, have done a good oral exam. Um, there's no doubt. I know them both quite well, and they're excellent. Um, she's an older dog, and they develop dental disease. And it's just kind of, 
it's it's part of having an older dog i have to say that like it just is what it is you know they're they're old and they're te it's hard to keep any of these dogs teeth really you know clean for that many years and so as long as she's eating and she's comfortable i think that's probably not her major issue okay okay thank you mm -hmm. Um, my dog has a, I think it's called a mangioma. A uh, mangioma? She, mangioma. She's being treated here. Um, and my understanding is that's a, it's a brain tumor, but it's not. A meningioma. Men, sorry. That's okay. No, I'm sorry. I didn't understand. <laughs> oh, meningioma. Uh-huh. made that up as I went. It's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I don't really know the difference between a non-cancerous brain tumor and a cancerous brain tumor. So I was wondering if you, she's that's had radiation. That's a good question. You know, meningioma is sort of, it's a very unique tumor. It is a benign tumor, but it's one of the few benign tumors that actually can be fatal because it's space occupying. And so, you know, we know that the brain only has so far to go in the skull before we're going to have neurologic issues. But, and neurology is treating your dog? Yes. Okay. And how are they treating it? She's already had radiation. Oh, excellent. So she's been with the RT team. Yes. Great. So, you know, they're, they're nicely, um, they're tumors that are nicely um, affected by radiation. So, and how does one know that a non-cancerous brain tumor can't see it? We don't biopsy those tumors routinely. Sometimes we do, but um, we know about the location and the infiltration on the CAT scan and the MRI. We have a question about GI lymphoma. What is the screening, treatment, and prognosis for that? In cats? Dogs. Dogs. So not such a common disease in dogs, more common in cats, but um, the abdominal ultrasound, like I talked about, that's the first sort of step that we would do with any dog that has gastrointestinal signs. And what about um, prognosis? It, that's a difficult question for me to answer because it's a, really just a term where there's multiple types of intestinal lymphomas in dogs, and I'm reluctant to sort of... Um, put a prognosis on something without knowing more information. Okay. Uh, someone wants to know if you can talk more about injection sites, carcinomas in cats, and are certain vaccines more prone to creating them than others? Yeah. So um, injection site sarcomas are, you know, one of the diseases we all hate seeing because we caused them. In reality, you know, practice has changed so much now that there are really, there are very few vaccines left on the market that we think even cause these tumors, but it's not just vaccines that cause injection site sarcomas. Any injection can cause a sarcoma in a cat. People get these too, and so do dogs. They're just much less common. They're much more common in cats. Not that common, you know, one in 10,000 to one in 100,000 cats will develop this disease. And as far as, you know, we have good practice now where we vaccinate, we try to vaccinate on the tail of cats or lower on the leg in cats. God forbid they develop this disease, we're able to amputate their leg or remove their tail, where historically cats were always vaccinated in the intrascapular area, and that's a much more difficult place. I have to say, as I practice, I see less and less and less of these because we have less immunogenic vaccines which were caused this sort of immune reaction and then uh, cats like to build tissue around these immune reactions and ultimately uh, caused cancer but I, we're we've moved in the right direction and the veterinary community has gotten a good hold on this disease process great do we have any other questions from the audience I'm the one who asked the question about the GI lymphoma. Oh, okay. So, so what I give me do, some more all I know at this point from the abdominal ultrasound is um, diffuse thickening in the small bowel. Okay. Um, what kind of dog? Uh, Whippet. How old? Uh, 16. Oh, okay. okay. And um, she, they did a folic ass, they did some uh, GI uh -huh. panels. Yeah. She was low in her folic, just mildly low. They repeated it. The first one was fasting, the second one was non-fasting, and then it was normal. Again, we did. I started some herbs in the interim, um, and then it normalized. But it was a, a non-fasting the second time. I'm not sure how much of a difference that made, um, and that's kind of where we're at now, and we're continuing the work up. Yeah, I think um, the next step is aspirating the GI tract. Not every radiologist can do that, but um, ours here certainly can, and that would be the next step because lymphoma is a pretty easy diagnosis to to demonstrate. So that would be my next step if it was reachable via aspirate. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's one way. We usually go to cytology first here if we can. It's just less invasive. You can suggest it. You can ask about it. Sure. I have a general question just for pet owners when their pet does get diagnosed with cancer for the first time and they get that terrible diagnosis. What are some things that you tell them to keep in mind or advice that you give for them going forward? So that's a good question. I just finished this really interesting book on women's health and you know everyone is afraid of cancer but the reality is that one in eight women will get breast cancer and most will survive it one in two women will die of heart disease. So I don't know, I mean, does, do most of you walk around worrying about heart disease? Probably not, but everyone is scared of cancer. So I will tell you that our patients are likely the healthiest patients in this hospital. We rarely have hospitalized patients. They come in through the clinic, we see them, they get their treatments, they go home. Most of them are happy and healthy and well. We cure about 50%, and the ones that we don't cure live their life with cancer. They're not dying of cancer, they're living with cancer, and they have excellent quality of lives. And so, and we know we have the gift of, uh, we think, the gift of euthanasia in veterinary medicine, so when they are suffering, we can stop immediately. So although it's very scary, we have great treatments, great options, and we have a whole team to support the parents of these pets that are going through the process. Thank you very much. And do one last call for questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I have a cat who was diagnosed with small cell lymphoma by Dr. Palma in internal medicine um, last summer. And, you know, I love Dr. Palma, it's a great team. But I was curious, I mean, you were describing your team on the eighth floor, it sounded amazing. Do you guys share patients? Does it make sense? What's your cat being treated with? Um, Chlorambucil and prednisolone. Yeah, sometimes Palma keeps his lymphoma patients. It, you know, it, it, he knows what he's doing. That's what I can tell you. You're in excellent hands. He's one of the smartest guys in this hospital. Um, you're always welcome to come get a consult with us, but you know, you're in good hands with him. But you know, we we all work as a team, and if you want to us to review the case and you want to chat with us, you certainly can make a consultation appointment. We can chat with you and then you can still use Dr. Palma as your forever doctor, whatever is most comfortable to you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Liebman. Thanks.